Well, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for our library's program from the National Park Service. Tonight's program is the importance of Bunker, Manhattan, to the Atlantic fisheries. My name is Tara Moran. I'm a librarian at the Mastic Merch and Shirley Community Library, and I am happy to introduce you to tonight's speaker, Patricia Riley, park ranger with the Fire Island National Seashore. If you have any questions during this program, please enter them into the chat box. You may be able to ask them as they go if there's a little break in, the, in between, um, but we will definitely get to any questions at the end as well. So Pat, if you're ready, please tell us all about bunker fish. Yes, okay. Um, bunker, are you hear the word all the time, fishermen talk about um, buying bunker for bait, um, if you follow any social media photographers or videographers, we see loads of these bunker pods off of Fire Island with whales feeding. So um, bunker or Manhattan are some, somewhat of a mystery if you only use them as bait or only seen them on these um, photos by, you know, of whales eating bunker. And what people don't realize is they are key to our ocean ecosystem. Um, really, really important. And so we're going to talk about um, some historical things. Um, here's a little quiz question. What do these have in common? <laughs> so um, I have my fishing lures here. They kind of represent recreational fishing. I have on the right, some of these yellow capsules, which fish oil capsules, right? And then in the middle, I have Indian corn. So I'm gonna tie this all together um, because when you were, when I was in probably elementary school, junior high, this is going back a ways, um, we learned about the pilgrims who came to America and they learned how to plant corn. And there was a friendly Native American. Does anybody remember his name? He spoke some English. Put it in the chat. If you know it, you get bonus points for this one. Nobody? Okay. Um, his name was Squanto. So this drawing may or may not um, be Squanto, this Native American. But what you see him doing is dropping a fish into a hole. And so early settlers to this country um, learned a lot from the natives. And one of the things they learned was to plant a fish with their corn. And it was successful. And what was this fish? So let me see if I can move my slide along. Here is what they called that fish. I do not attempt to pronounce this, but it was a word that meant fertilizer. And English language, it became Menhaden. So Manawadiag, um, there's other names for these fish. Um, they're known as Bunker. They're known as pogi from other Native American words. Again, I won't attempt to pronounce them. So colonists had lots of names for them. Pogue Hayden, bony fish, white fish, pogi, moss bunker, fat bat, and bughead. So these were all um, various translations and mistranslations from the Native American where they heard the name of these words. Um, but they've also been called the most important fish in the sea. So historically, they have been used for uh, fertilizer for crops, feed for animals, um, bone meal, fish meal that's fed to farm animals, fishing bait, you can go into most tackle shops and buy a bag of bunker, oil for human consumption, oh, misspelling there, sorry, um, fish oil supplements, oil for manufacturing and oil as a fuel source. And it was used for all of these things. Um, current use, fish bait. But countries where 
fish oil is uh, abundant, they actually use it in biofuel. So it's used to fuel engines like vehicles and farm machinery um, where, where they have more production than they need it for a food source. So let's talk about the fish. We'll talk a little bit about the historical use, but let's talk about these fish. So they move in huge schools. They feed on the ocean's smallest creatures. So they eat phytoplankton and zooplankton. So plankton are the tiniest uh, creatures in the sea, the sort of the bottom of the food chain. These fish now become the second to bottom of the food chain. Phytoplankton, yes, whales, baleen whales may be able to eat plankton directly. Uh, some other fish eat plankton directly, but in most cases, the big fish eat the little fish. So um, these are a word uh, that's used for these is forage fish. So forage fish provide food for larger fish. Uh, marine predators, including striped bass, okay? Fishermen are out there through December now. Striped bass is the target species, uh, but also tuna, bluefish, tarpon, and whales. If you've uh, sat on Fire Island beaches for any length of time, you would know that the osprey also eat bunker. So they dive in and grab them. Eagles, loons. So what their job is to is to transform energy from phytoplankton to these larger animals, which are used as food uh, by humans. So they are transferring the energy from the bottom of the food chain to the top. And this is really important. So there's economic importance as well. Um, so seafood, commercial fishing, which includes species that prey on Manhattan support over 341,000 jobs along the Atlantic coast, uh, bringing with them 46.3 million in sales, sorry, billion dollars in sales. So the fishing industry, the seafood commercial uh, fishing industry is huge. Uh, recreation, recreational uh, anglers. There are 12.8 million resident recreational anglers who spend about $15.7 billion pursuing game fish and the game fish that eat Manhattan. I can attest that my husband spends hundreds on fishing lures and equipment um, in recreational fishing. And ecotourism, and that's becoming more and more important. Uh, there are whale watching tours, right? You can pay to go on a whale watching boat because um, we expect to see where there's bunker, we expect to see humpback and finback, all these baleen whales feeding on them. So um, if there are, let me find this fact and figure for you. There are wildlife watchers numbering about almost 30 million wildlife watchers in the Atlantic states. And they pour $17.7 .7 billion into the economy. And most of the, the whales, the birds, they're out there observing depend on Manhattan. So these are economically important as well as being so important to the ecosystem. Okay, what is a peanut bunker? People ask me this. I had to figure this out for myself. Um, the top picture, if you can tell the scale by the, by the human hand, um, peanut bunker are the immature bunker. So they spawn year round in inshore waters off the Atlantic coast. The eggs are buoyant and hatch in the open ocean within two to three days. The larva will spend two to three months in waters over the continental shelf and they drift to the sheltered estuaries via ocean currents. The young spend about a year developing in the estuaries before they return to the open ocean. So um, I live very near the Carmen's River. Um, some of you may too. And 
Early summer, you see loads of these tiny bunker jumping out of the water because something under the water is chasing them. So the peanut bunker, um, fishermen often catch them to use as live bait. And um, the, these little ones are called peanut bunker. And you can see by the size of the hand holding it, how much smaller it is. They do not become sexually mature until the end of their second year after which they reproduce until death and they live 10 to 12 years. So they could uh, for 10 years produce more eggs, more bunker. We th think of them as being very plentiful, um, though there have been issues lately. We're gonna talk a little more about that. So many sources today claim that menhaden or bunker are inedible to humans. And nowadays we have so many other sources of seafood that it's probably true, but they were um, touted as a food source. Um, marine fishermen back in um, maybe a hundred years ago would eat them like you would eat sardines. They fried them up, uh, fried pogies for breakfast was a thing. Um, so what was not sold as bait for fishermen was sold to the poorer classes as food. <clears throat> Excuse me. Interestingly, there is a, I just wanna throw this in here cause it popped into my head. <clears throat> There's a rumor or um, um, I don't know if you call it an urban legend that WD-40, you know, WD-40 that you spray to <clears throat> lubricate things is made from fish oil. Anybody believe that? Have you ever heard that before? Probably not true. So WD-40 is made mostly of petroleum products like mineral oil. Uh, but the importance of fish oil has is recognized now. Lots of people take fish oil supplements. Uh, certain components, um, cod liver oil is something that was used as a supplement 100 years ago. Um, it was not very popular with children. If you remember Spanky and our gang, cod liver oil was the worst. But it, it uh, contains vitamins A and D and Later on, it was actually refined and used to make margarine. So margarine is all kinds of unknown um, sort of oil sources, but, but menhaden oil was one at, at a certain time. It's also used in um, industrial purposes, such as paints, varnishes, and motor lubricants. Uh, but whenever this little poster was made, you could ask for a cookbook, how to cook your, um, your menhaden. So harvesting menhaden. They were harvested by fishermen uh, up and down the Atlantic coast, and there were fish factories there. And I have some dates and interesting factoids by 1880, half a billion menhaden were being rendered into oil and fertilizer. And at that time, 1880, they were converting whaling ships to bunker ships. So half a billion menhaden were rendered into oil and fertilizer, but there were almost three times as many menhaden fish as, sorry, ships as whaling ships. Whaling vessels were found to be more productive and um, produced more oil from collecting menhaden than a, okay, I have another fact. A menhaden boat could produce more oil in a week than a whaling ship could during its entire multi-year voyage. So this was going on up and down the East Coast and including here on Long Island. So here is a processing plant. Um, the, I did some research and the 1883 bicentennial of Suffolk County listed three Manhattan processing plants on the Great South Beach. 
which was an early name for Fire Island. So uh, these sites are actually, they still exist. The, um, the buildings, the factories are no longer there except um, between Seaview and Ocean Bay Park, western end of Fire Island. There's actually the remnants on the shoreline of some parts of the fish, one of the fish factories. But um, if you're uh, familiar with Fire Island, the Western communities at all, uh, the Kismet tennis courts are built over the site of an, um, one of these Menhaden processing plants. So this is one of those typical pictures we see of um, humpback whales feeding on bunker. And it's very, very dramatic. If you've ever seen videos of this, it's fabulous. Um, there's a really cool, um, I believe it's on Netflix, called uh, Secrets of the Whales, which shows um, humpback whales circling and creating bubbles and almost forming a bubble corral for bunker and then coming up and lunge feeding which means they would rise to the surface, like you see the whale in the picture, open mouth to collect as many as they could in one mouthful. So the numbers of bunker were decreasing. Um, last year, the Atlantic Fisheries, uh, the organization that um, that develops some of the um, harvest limits for fish for New York and other Atlantic states, um, decided to look into bunker as a species that should be limited or they should set harvest limits for. So I wanna uh, listen to a very short video, um, if I can make it play, yeah, where last April it was signed into law how important Bunker is to the fisheries, and everyone was very happy that they were finally being considered. The population of these was being considered in, in determining uh, harvest amounts. So let's listen to this guy. My name is Tony Friedrich. Vice President and Policy Director for the American Saltwater Guides Association. All the individuals you're about to meet come from very different backgrounds, yet our commitment to advancing big picture ecosystem-based management brings us together today in support of Menhaden. Today's decision is historic. It's a significant step forward in fisheries management. We understand this is a new approach, and we also understand that changes in management can sometimes feel like you're turning a battleship. But we need you to know that our businesses, our livelihoods, and for some, our complete identities are tied to taking this next step. My name's Peter Jenkins. I own the Saltwater Edge here in Newport, Rhode Island, and I'm also chairman of the American Saltwater Guide Association. And I want to take you a minute to tell you why uh, Menhaden is important to my business. That's a critical bait fish. It's the linchpin to the ecosystem here in the Northeast. You know, it supports osprey, it supports whales, it supports striped bass. I say both yes for the UCBRPs. Hi, Jason Jarvis. Commercial fisherman helping out my buddy Joe today, lobstering. And something is going on that we can all agree about. We need to deal with get the acronym right ERPs for an ecological based version of management, especially with Manhattan. My name is Tyke James, and I'm in Washington, D.C. Manhattan are important to me because I'm a birder. I lead with my appreciation for birds, knowing that conservation decisions that protect Manhattan also support the broader marine ecosystem on the Atlantic coast. Please adopt ERPs to help protect our favorite forward fish. Hello, my name is Kyle Schaefer. I run Soulfly Outfitters. I'm out of Southern Maine. Menhaden are incredibly important to the fishery up here. We've had them back in these waters in great numbers for three years, and it's completely transformed what we see on the coast from bluefin tuna to big striped bass to whales and birds, all being able to feast on these fish. ASMFC, please adopt ERPs to help manage our favorite bait fish and one of the most important fish in the ocean. Hi, my name is Chef Terry Heffernan. I work at Grand Banks, which is a restaurant on the water. Menhaden in that water, 
makes a big difference to how we're going to make our living. Forage fish are super important to the predators, some of which we serve, all of which are very important to the entire ecosystem. I'm Mike Avery with the Virginia Saltwater Sport Fishing Association. Menhaden is very important to me uh, to have healthy stocks in Menhaden here in the Chesapeake Bay. And especially we need to move towards the ecological reference points for Menhaden. Hi everyone, I'm Zach Cliver, a naturalist from Bar Harbor, Maine. And I sincerely care about Menhaden. Uh, they are critical food for marine wildlife, whales, and recreational fisheries that support millions of dollars of coastal economy. Please support ERPs and ecosystem management. Hi, my name is Ellen Pickett, and I'm a professor at Stony Brook University in New York. The science is clear that forage species, such as menhaden, play a crucial role in maintaining the health of our ocean. Now, we have scientifically based ecological reference points that are tailored specifically to Menhaden, and these should be implemented as quickly as possible. Hello, I'm Paul Seaford, a president of Gotham Whale, and I'm on board the American Princess, and we're whale watching right outside of New York City. That's right, whale watching. The waters around New York are full of whales, all because of Menhaden. And we want to encourage the ASMFC to endorse the ecological reference points that will consider our whales and keeping them well fed. Hey guys, this is Captain Corey Crochetier, currently in Montauk, New York, uh, but I am based out of Westport, Connecticut. Uh, Menhaden are very important to us based on sales of fish boats and also for our tuna fishery, which is what we charter for. ASMFC, please adopt ERPs to help protect our favorite forage fish. Hi, my name is Richard Brayman. I'm the Atlantic States Fisheries Director for CCA in Wilmington, North Carolina. Menhaden are a keystone forage species, and every angler knows where there's bait, there's most likely fish to catch. The goal in the 20 plus years we've been involved with Menhaden at ASMFC was always for management to account for their critical ecological role. Kudos to the folks who developed the ERP, something I never thought I'd see in my life. You now have before you an, an historic opportunity to set ERPs for Menhaden and finally manage Menhaden properly. I hope you take advantage of it. Who would have thought marine biologists, recreational anglers, bird watchers, whale enthusiasts, and even commercial fishermen would all come together under the same virtual tent to support Menhaden? When I think about the process of big picture fisheries management, one quote comes to mind. Perfection's the enemy of progress. While this isn't perfect yet, it is peer-reviewed science and it is supported. So I ask you to take the next step to better account for Menhaden's role in the ecosystem and for all of us. Please consider voting yes on ERPs. We thank you all for all the hard work you've done and we look forward to working with you in the future. Okay, so that video was presented to the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission um, about a year and a half ago. So this was actually the, the commission took it very seriously and decided to consider Menhaden an ERP, which means they're not just junk fish. They are regulated. They're... Um, their numbers are now uh, limited. So um, today the recreational limit is in New York is 100 per person per day. So this includes peanut bunker for a, uh, a fisherman who might be looking for bait. Commercially, um, depending on the type of permit, they can take 6,000 to 10,000 pounds a day, up to 30,000 pounds a week. Now that sounds like an awful lot of fish, and it is. But it was totally uncontrolled before this, this was um, passed last April. So April of 2020. Um, you may have heard about bunker die-offs. So I'm going to go to that. Um, what causes bunker die-off? Well, there are a lot of these fish. We may be seeing more bunker die-off because, just because there are more fish around now, which is a, a good thing. Um, the usual cause is lack of oxygen. So if there are a lot of game fish or whales chasing 
bunker into a small area, an estuary. So many fish in one area, there's not enough oxygen in the water for them all, so they die off. Um, sometimes it's toxic algae, which is called by, caused by nitrogen pollution, in our, in, especially in the Great South Bay. Um, when several million bunker died in the Shinnecock Canal in 2016, and this made news all over the place, the raft of dead fish left the shorelines three feet deep in rotting bunker. What a stinky mess. They're usually very, very localized though. And um, it's, it's, the, it's the extreme numbers deprive a certain area, they, they deplete the oxygen, and there's not enough oxygen for them all. Um, last year, or sorry, last, well, it started last fall into this spring, um, Bunker were dying of something else. And if you observed it, it was, um, it was a little scary. The fish would swim in circles. They would flop on the surface, and these were not crowded fish. It wasn't thousands of fish all in one place. And they started to bleed. So this was a little creepy. I We watched some of them do this in, in the Patrog River. And they do believe it was a bacterial infection. So the bacteria in some of the dead fish collected um, was a bacteria known as Vibrio. And they occur naturally. They're not harmful to humans. But the New York State DEC still says, if you see a dead bunker, don't touch it. Um, don't let your dog eat it because they're not 100% sure. They're still researching this. Um, are the numbers increasing? If you look at this, the, this was the best graphic that I could find, and it's in the Chesapeake Bay. So this is in the Chesapeake Bay, which is part of the Atlantic fishery that we're uh, involved in and the they finally capped the number that they could take in um 2012 so um if you look at this chart um numbers were very high in the 70s and then they were fished to the extreme all over the coast especially in chesapeake bay through the 90s the numbers were very low but if we look toward the right hand edge of this graph, they're starting to creep up. Um, it could be more fish, uh, they're slowly reproducing, could be that the catch is, is less because people are taking less, the regulations have changed. Um, but anecdotally, the whale watchers, the people that you saw in that video say there's more bunker today. Um, if you look at some Instagram accounts of photographers who, um, who photograph these bunker pods right off the beaches of Fire Island, they, there appear to be an awful lot of bunker. Whether it's due to the warmer temperature, I'm not quite sure, but we should be worried um, or concerned because Manhattan are really the bottom of this food web. As I mentioned before, they eat the plankton, they convert it into this forage fish that then, in this diagram, we see bass, sharks, whales, and birds um, all uh, survive off these fish. So I think that video was especially really cool because you got to see some of those um, whale eating bunker videos, which are always fun. So um, are there any questions for me? I don't know if I went through this too quickly. Sorry. But, uh, Pat, are the bunk? It's Steve. Okay. Are bunker here all year round? Yes, they are. Oh. Yes, they are. Okay, I see a question. How do we help to conserve bunker fish? Um, it's not, you know, it's tough for an individual because we're looking at commercial fisheries that are fishing them for um animal feed let's say or fertilizer 
as long as we have growing numbers of humans on the earth, they're gonna, people are gonna be looking for new ways to um, increase crop production. And so menhaden are always gonna be um, a species that people want. It's, it's useful in so many ways. We could help prevent the die-offs by helping to um, stop the algae blooms. And algae blooms are caused by nitrogen runoff. So a lot of that has to do with fertilizer on people's lawns. Uh, runoff carries it into our, our, the bay, the Great South Bay. Um, another one which is even bigger is the septic systems we use on Long Island. We have very, very few sewer systems here on Long Island. Most people have the ordinary septic, septic tank, which is pretty much you flush your toilet, it goes into a big thing underground and eventually leaches into the soil. And all our water moves, all of our groundwater is moving towards the bay. And it's really hard to stop that unless you get one of these advanced systems um, I know that uh, Suffolk County, Brookhaven Town are offering grants to convert. They're very expensive, though, and um, I don't know anybody who's ever done that. I don't know if any of you know anybody. Um, but reducing the nitrogen can help some of the die-offs. Um, that's the only thing I can think of that we can, that we can do as individuals. Uh, I wouldn't say stop buying fish oil capsules. I, I think that's a very small part of it. I think the industrial use, um, when you consider they're using uh, fish oil as biofuel in um, European countries and Asia, they're running their machinery off of fish oil. So um, the step that they took to monitor the species last year was really, really important. Other questions, comments? Yes. Um, who monitors this species? Do you have a part in that? Um, we do not. Um, it is the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. And part of that is the New York State DEC. Anybody in New York, any commercial fisherman or any interested party can actually join in on the discussions that the DEC has about um, harvest numbers. So it's very interesting. I actually sat in on one of these conferences once just because I didn't know what it was. Um, if you go to the New York State DEC website or subscribe to any of their newsletters, they have a lot of them, um, you'll see these meetings come up quarterly. And fishermen and uh, commercial fishermen, charter fishermen, other people in the industry get together and discuss how many fish they should take. The New York State DEC determines fishing limits based on what people are catching and how many are actually being harvested. Um, I've met a few over on Fire Island, um, New York State DEC officers whose job was to sit in the parking lot out at Smith Point and interview fishermen as they came off the beach to see what they were catching. It had nothing to do with enforcement. It just was, how many did you catch today? How long were you here? Because they're trying to get a handle on um, what recreational fishermen are catching. Um, and manual harvesting, yes. that This is, uh, well, let me finish with the, well, first of all, the DEC, um, a lot of their limits are set by what the catch is. How many fish are commercial fishermen actually catching and they somehow crunch the numbers to determine how many should be taken now this process was only done with our sport fish uh, and our food fish it's only recently now being done for menhaden manual harvesting um would you, would you mean hook and line or an individual throwing a net out I'm not sure who made that comment. Herbert. Um, manual harvesting as in individuals rather than huge corporations. It's the economies of scale. I don't think we're ever going to go back to 
I'm going to go and collect, you know, Manhattan to sell to the fish oil company. I don't think we'll ever go back to that because of the economies of scale. Manual netting. Yeah, it's um, it advanced so well in the last hundred years. The fish factories, yes, there's much there are fewer fish factories because the the scale has gone off the charts. OK. OK, this is interesting. Uh, what is this link um, that you sent S Mr. Mr. or Miss Myers? If you want to unmute and. Is this a re this looks like recent, right? 21 2021 fall meeting. All right, I'm going to click on it. <laughs> Okay. There is a fisheries board meeting coming up. Interesting. Okay. That's a great idea the, the, to, I would absolutely, if I could get myself into that meeting, just to listen to what they're saying. Um, but the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission are the ones that make these big decisions and that they're the ones that that video was targeted at so that they would make good decisions or better decisions about Menhaden. It'll be web-based. Okay, good. Good, good. I will definitely look it up. I'm going to copy it right now while it's still here. Um, anybody else? Any comments, questions? Has anybody ever eaten a bunker? No. Was that a no, Steve? No, that was a no, yeah. <laughs> um, I once cooked a bluefish that had been eating bunker, and I had to throw it away. It stunk like bunker. Bunker have a very oily and not very pleasant smell to them. I can't imagine eating one. Anything else? I hope you learned something. I learned an awful lot just doing this research. Um, and I was happy to share with you guys. That's great. Thank you so much, Pat, for your program. It, it was very informative. Now, I will say to everyone else, um, if you are a member of our library, our next nature program will be the guided woodland hike at Quag Wildlife Refuge on Saturday, November 6th at 10 a.m. This one is in person. I know we're online right now, but this one is, a, is an actual walk through the facility. And if you're interested in that, please go ahead and register online at communitylibrary.org slash programs or give us a call at 631-399-1511. And if you'd like to know more about Fire Island National Seashore, be sure to visit their website um, at nps.gov slash F-I-I-S, two eyes. <laughs> right. And, um, oh, someone asked, can bunker be smoked? That's a thought. If you try it, let me know. So I'm glad you enjoyed it and learned something. Um, I'd love to see everybody out at our Wilderness Visitor Center. Um, I'll make a quick plug for um, this Saturday, we have a geology hike yeah. um, with Dr. Bennington from uh, one of our local universities. And um, you'd have to, sign up if anybody wants the number i can um I'll write it for more information or to reserve you can call us at our um wilderness visitor center and for more information or to um to make a reservation for the hike that's our wilderness visitor center down at smith point and i i'm down that's there i'd love to hear from you <laughs> Will you be going through the dunes, the beach, all of it? How long do you know? Um, I'm not 100% sure. 
I'm going to guess the beach, but starting at the top of the dune, and it's going to be about the geology of uh, Long Island and Fire Island. So that should be interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Well, thank you so much, everybody. And I'm glad you were able to join us. Thank you, Pat, for always having these great presentations. They've been very informative. And we'll see you again next time. Thanks, yes. everyone. Thanks, Pat. You're welcome. Good to see you, Steve. You too. Take care. Bye. Bye.